everybody, and welcome to chapter 14 of the Enola Holmes mystery, the case of the missing Marquess. Chapter the 14th. Gasping for breath, we darted into a gloomy, dirty, cluttered room that felt as close as an oven. From one side wall hung a number of long cloaks and mantles. For quick concealment, we pressed ourselves into the shadowy folds. Hands clenched. I watched the front door, waiting to see whether my bride would succeed. Hide under the table, Tweaky whispered. I shook my head, posed to flee, staring out the front window. I saw how folk scattered, giving way that the hulking cutthroat and his squeaky monogrole of a companion barreled down the middle of the street, glaring in all directions. I saw the big ruffian grab the loiterer by the collar almost giving the man off his feet, shouting in his face, the poor fellow gestured in our direction, and where Mrs. Colohane had gone. I did not know, but there she was again, standing her back to me. She looked like a plaid tortoise, with a limp bow of apron strings across its middle. Our moon-faced enemy and his follower strode up to her, towered over her, even rickety Squeaky stood taller than she did, and I'm not sure I could have braved the ferocity in their glares. But the squat old woman occupied that doorway like a plug. I saw her shake her head. I saw her gesture towards the far end of the street. I saw a sunlit doorway as a halo of glory surrounding her. I saw the two villains turn away, hanging onto somebody's old cape for support. I sagged against a wall with relief. Tweaky folded like an easel, sinking to the floor. Mrs. Colohane quite sensibly did not come in at once, but stood at the door for a while longer. By the time she entered, I had recovered my strength, found a back room with a water tap, soaked a rectangle of faded red flannel, and applied it to Tweaky's face. When he sat up, I transferred my attention to his suffering feet, dabbed the rag, at trying to re- Move dirt and blood without hurting him too much. I was studying his raw, sore souls when our toad-like savior came in, shut and locked the shop door, drew down its blind, and waddled over to me. So, she said, one day you're a grieving whittler, and the next day it turns out you're a stingy-haired girl running from cut, cutter and squeaky. Indeed, and who might this gentleman be? We, are, we were not introduced. I don't doubt it that me stomach binder that's me stomach stomach binder you're using for a rag I, st I stood up merciful heavens I think I've paid you for it she faced me unsmiling no cheery robin chirp in her manner vo or voice today no ducky for me she said what you gave me went to the neighbors others who saw this, I realized, must be partly true. She had disappeared from the doorway to bargain with stan bystanders for their silence. But by the shrewd glint in her eye, I knew it was also parsley false. She promised the neighbors some shillings, or a few pounds at the very most. Still, there was nothing honest in the grimness of her face, as she told me. There best be more where that came from. Cutter would slice me inside if he knew make no mistake if he knew make no mistake about it it's my life i'm risking for ye if you provide what i need what we need i told her there will be more so it was that the next day tweaky and i had slipped out of her shop by the back door straightened and transformed we had taken refuge in a rather slovenly kitchen for she lived up in three rooms on the first floor over the shop and we had accepted her lumpy porridge gratefully. We had slept on her foul-smelling sofa, tweaky on the quilts on her floor. We had taken sponge baths. We had applied long, applied bag balm, ointment for cow otters, to Tweaky's feet. Then wrapped them in bandages. We had outfitted ourselves in apparel from Colhan's used clothing, burning our old things in the kitchen stove. We had not talked, not even to tell one another our names. Our sour-faced ho hostess had asked us no questions. 
and we had offered no information. Tweaky and I did not even converse between ourselves, lest she overhear. I did not trust her. I would not have put it beyond her to separate me from all of my money if she discovered where I kept it. Therefore, I never removed my clothing in her presence, and I never removed my corset at all, not even to sleep. The once despised garment had become my most pre precious possession, as so long as I did not actually tighten it. Its steely production had saved my life, its starchy structure had supported and concealed my the bust enhancer, dress improver, and the hip regulators that disguised both me and my f financial be means. I hope and hope that Mrs. Colhane, if that were indeed her name, never discovered this secret. We spoke only to conduct business. Might her shop provide a suit of clothes not too worn for the boy, and a cap, and a ample pair of shoes, and a thick socks, and for me a blouse, a, and a bustled or gored skirt, such as a typist or glove counter girl might wear, made of practical material with pockets, and a jacket also with pockets. Its hem flared to fit over the top of the skirt, and gloves not too sploit, and hat not too far out of fashion, and would she give me a bit of help with my hair. I felt naked to the eyes of the world, leaving that my place without my thick black widow's veil to, to cover my face, but the truth was that even, in my own, even my own brothers might not have known me. I stooped and peered un nearsightedly through the through the Prince Nez eyeglasses clipped onto my nose, perched there like a bizarre mental bird. Over the eyeglass, a considerable fringe of false hair both decorated and hid my forehead. As sitting the pr Prince Nez in altering my profile, and the hair wore a straw hat trimmed with bits of lace, feathers, and very much like any cheap straw hat worn by any struggling young woman in the city. Now I just need a parcel, I told Mrs. Colhane. She gave me one dyed, a hideous but stylish chemically diverted green, then escorted us to her back door and held out her hand. Upon her palm, as I promised, I placed another banknote. We exited and she closed the door behind us without a word. Once we had achieved the street, I shuffled as I walked, acting half blind, feeling my way with folded parcel. I did this partly as a disguise and partly so Tweaky, whose feet were still quite sore, would not appear to struggle along, but rather walk slowly, accompanying me for my sake. In our clothing, neither new nor worn out, neither rich nor poor, I hoped we would escape anyone's attention, for I wanted no bearing news of us to cut her. But I need not have worried. All around us, folk went noisily about their business, taking no notice of us at all. London, that great brisk and stone, cauldron of a city, always seemed on a boil with swirling human activity. A man with a barrow cried, Ginger beer, fresh cold ginger beer to, to cool your dusty throat. A water cart trundled past, followed by boys clavering, cleaning the cobbles with brooms. A delivery man paddled on the oldest tricycle I had ever seen, with two wheels in front instead of the rear, with a great box strapped to the handlebars. On a corner stood a three dark-haired children, singing in harmony like angles, in a language I did not know, the middle one with a crookery cup extended for my pen penny, just beyond and above them a ragged man with a paste can and a brush balanced on a ladder sticking up advertisements for shoe blackening anti rheumatic elastic wrappings patient safety coffins men in white jack sack jackets and white trousers nailed a quarantine notice onto the doorway of lo of a lodging i wondered briefly what vile fevers and, and diseases wafted up from the stinking thames and whether I would perish of cholera or scarlet fever for having set foot on Cutter's vessel. Cutter, charming ruffian, in one of my pockets along with money and various other useful items, had transferred there from my bust enhancer. I have carried a list I had written in some wake wakeful hours during the night. Why did Cutter search the train? 
Why did he follow me? Why did he think I knew where to find Tweaky? What did he want with Tweaky? Why did he wire Squeaky to look for Tweaky on the docks? What did he mean when he said much the same? Is he a business of kidnapping? How did he know anything about Tweaky and the Grand Eastern at all? How indeed? I had told Inspector Lestrade and Madame, what was her name, an astral predation had overheard. Had Inspector Lestrade told the others, perhaps eventually, but it would not have first taken steps to confirm my information. Yet the wire must have been sent to Squeaky almost immediately. Hmm. Such were my thoughts as my limping escort and I walked a few blocks to a better neighborhood. Here we found part, a park of sorts, a patch of grass with four trees under which a woman trundled prams and a man with a donkey cried, Rides, treat your kids a penny a head. Beside the park I saw, I saw stood a number of cabs. I would have been able to hire one, uh, so my little lordship would not have to walk on his suffering feet. So far much on our ground, we had not spoken at all, but now we had left Cutter's haunts behind. I turned to my companion and smiled. Well, Tweaky, I said, don't call me that. I bristled. Very well, Lord Stooksbury of Baselweather, or not. But my annoyance subsided as thought struck me. I asked, what do you want to be called? What name have you chosen for yourself when you ran off? I... He shook his head and turned his face away. Never mind. It doesn't matter anymore. Why? What were you going to do? I don't know. Do you still want to go to sea? He swiveled and stared at me. He swiveled to stare at me. You know everything. How do you know so much? Who are you? Are you really related to Sherlock Holmes? I bit my lip, for I did not feel it would be safe to tell him any more of myself. He already knew too much. Luckily, at the moment, a newsboy howled from the corner cab stand. Read all about it. Ransom for demand for Vincent... Viscount Tewksbury Baselweather. What? I exclaimed. That's preposterous. Almost forgetting to peer and shuffle, I scuttered over and bought a newspaper. Sentinel Development and Kidnapping Case. Read the overhead overline over once again. Tweaky's portrait in La Little Ford Frontery. Sitting next to me on a park bench so that we could both see the newspaper at once. Tweaky made a muffled sound of dismay. My picture? The whole world has viewed it, I I told with I told him with admit some degree of zest. Then as he did not immediately reply, I glanced at him to see upon his face an expression of fiery red, utterly anguished humiliation. I can't go back, he said. I'll never go back. No longer gleeful, I asked. But what if someone recognizes this the picture. Mrs. Colhane, for instance, she, when would she ever look at a newspaper? She can't read. In those slums, nobody can read. Did you see any newsboys at, by the, at, by the docks? At the docks? He was right, of course, but rather than admit it, I devoted my attention to the next, to the text of the article. A most surprising turn of events took place this morning with the arrival of an unsigned ransom demand at, at Baselweather Hall. Belvedere scene, of the recent disappearance of Viscount Tewksbury, Marquis of Baselweather, despite Chief Inspector Lestrade's most, most acute discovery of the young lord's cachet of nautical paranorma in his treetop hideaway. Oh no, Tweaky whispered, anguished anew, wincing. I had read on without a comment. And his subsequent energetic inquiries at the London docks where he had located every several eyewitnesses to to who have claimed seen the missing youngster upon the very day of his disappearance which I realized just one day after that of my own disappearance so much had happened since it was hard to believe that only three days ago I had left Ferndale Hall it would appear now that Viscount heir to ba Baselweather title and fortune has indeed been kidnapped delivered in the morning post a brief missive pasted together out of letters cut from periodicals demanded a large sum the amount which the family desires to remain und undisclosed lacking any proof that lord stooksbury has indeed fallen into the hands of this unknown individual or individuals the authorities advise against paying the ransom famed medium and astral 
Pedersen, Madame Le Leila Chibille de, Le de la Vaupas, however, called in by the Baselweather family at the onset of the crime, at the crisis, advises most strongly that the ransom which gathered in the form of gold sovereigns and guidance of pending instructions for delivery should be paid as her communications with spiritual manifestations advise her that Viscount Tewksbury is indeed held captive and indeed in, in danger of his very life unless the kidnappers receive full unless the kidnappers receive the full cooperation of the fam fam of his family madam Layla there was more but at this point I ceased reading instead I sat staring at the cab stand rally that stood before what tweak in me sporty ransom handsome cabs and clumsy a bit more roomy four-wheelers glossy horses and scrawny horses swishing their tails while munching on nose bags of oats potly cab drivers and shabby cab drivers loitering waiting for fares but i not but i was not in fact seeing any of this i was trying to remember what madame Leila had looked like but so much had happened in the past three days that I retained only an impression of red hair, large face, large body, large hands, yellow kid gloves. A small voice said, I have to go back. It took me a moment to turn and focus on Tweaky, pale and handsome and very young, returning my gaze. I have to go home, he said. I can't let those bloody villains steal from my family. He, I nodded. You have an idea who sent the ransom, yes? Ransom note, then. Yes. And you imagine, as I do, that they are still upon the hunt for you, for both of us. Yes, indeed. We better go to the police. I suppose so. But his glance slid away. He studied the tips of his new shoes, only in a sense that they had all too clearly been cobbled together from old pieces of leather, scavenged from old boots. I waited. Finally, he said, it wasn't what I expected anything anyway. The shipyards, I mean. The water is filthy, so are the people. They don't like one if one tries to stay clean they think one is a snob even in the big even the beggars spit on me somebody stole my money my boots even my stockings some people are so mean they would even steal from the crawlers the crawlers dosses they call them because they're always dowsing i've never seen any per persons so wretched his voice lowered, old women with nothing left, not even the strength to stand on their feet. They sit on the workhouse steps, half asleep, with nowhere to lay their hands, too nearly dead to even beg, and if someone gives them a penny to buy a tree, they crawl away to get it. With a shock to my heart, I remember the hairless wo old woman I had seen crawling on the pavement, her, shoe her head all sores, and then they crawl back again, Twinkie said. His voice lower and more struggling by the moment. There they sit, three times a month. They are all allowed a meal and a night's sleep for in the workhouse. Three times. If they ask for more than that, they are locked up and given three days at hard labor. What? But I thought the workhouse was supposed to help the unfortunate. I thought that too. I went there to ask for shoes, and they laughed at me and hit me with a stick, drove me away, and then that nasty man. His memories of Squeaky made his eyes water. He ceased speaking. I'm glad you decided to go home, I said after a moment. Your mother will be overjoyed to see you. She's been crying, you know. He nodded, accepting without question that I would know this. As I seem to know everything else, I'm sure you'll be able to make her understand you can't wear those lord front so leave me clothes anymore he said very softly whatever kind of clothes it is doesn't matter i never know but he didn't finish i believe he was still thinking about the dosses or the poor uh, half alive old woman who crawled or perhaps the bare sore feet and and the water from and squeaky and being kicked like a dog two days in london had made me aware too of much that i had not known before and now that i did know from my ill own ill fortunes seemed to small enough. I had I stood up and hailed a cab, an open handsome cab. I wanted us to go in style. Tweaky gave me his hand like a gentleman as I climbed in, and I just and I just graded the driver to Scotland Yard. End of chapter fourteen.